welcome back to the Bitter Betty podcast. I'm Bitter Betty Deadhead here with my two cohorts. Bitter Betty Tova. And Bitter Betty Carol with an E. All right, guys. We're back with chapter five. Again, we're live. We're going through all the chapters on our live today. So if you see us talking to people, that's what's up. Anyways, I'm going to say that in every video, by the way. <laughs> Y'all ready? I'm ready. I tried to cling on to music and whatever ways I could during the time I was sick. During my time in Brighton, whenever my energy would allow it, I'd get myself out onto the streets and I'd go busking, about once every three weeks or so. It was my second year in Brighton, and I remember one evening heading home with my guitar and my busking amp after a couple of hours of playing on the street. I remember hearing this amazing ethereal voice while heading through the lanes, and I saw that it was coming from this 16-year-old kid. I've always had a deep admiration and feeling of camaraderie for buskers. There's something about the willingness to be able to bear your soul to a street full of strangers that really moves me. I noticed that the kid didn't have an amp. He was singing totally a cappella, but you'd only hear him if you were within a few metres of him. I knew from years on the street and singing a cappella than myself that an amp can change everything. I had this compulsion to offer him mine. I approached him and I told him that if he plugged in and sang while I played guitar, the whole street would stop in its tracks. And I was right. His voice soared across the street and people started stopping. Not long after we had the whole street's attention. Something quite magic was happening. This was the first day that I met Sam Tompkins, someone who would be integral to my whole life wow. changing later on. He had a friend with him, this guy called Connor Honeyset, who would later go on to be my manager. For now, they'd just be a couple of teenagers that I'd have to help out on my way home. It's funny how life works like that. I kept up to date with what Sam was doing on social media. There was a part of me that felt like his successes allowed me to live vicariously through someone else who lived an alternate reality where I never got sick. He was getting videos on SBTV, writing and featuring with some amazing artists, and there were quite a lot of similarities in our writing styles, and all at such a young age. I wasn't really able to do any of that stuff at the time. I was mostly bedbound with the exception of the odd day that I'd be able to go busking. It could have been e very easy for that feeling to turn into jealousy, but it never did. I felt truly proud of him. Years later, we go, go on to write a song together called Blind Died, which would transform the That's trajectory in my whole career. During this time, I was still desperately jumping from one treatment to another treatment. And now that my diet had become more limited, I was trying new diets with no luck. As the options in the alternative health world started to dwindle, I started searching for answers in the divine. In the former years, I had moments where I found myself sitting in churches, talking in tears to whoever might be listening, or experimenting with energetic healing modalities like Reiki. With time, my searching started taking even more unusual turns, I started looking to things like exorcists. Once you exhaust all rational explanations and treatments, the irrational suddenly starts looking more palatable. I had a skeptic's mind, but I had nothing to lose because there were no other good options. My friend Momoko's mother was from Japan. She aligned herself with a sect of Buddhism called the Nichiren Daishonin. They would chant a repeated phrase over and over again while holding prayer beads. The chant would go, Nam yo ho renge kyo, nam yo ho renge kyo, nam yo ho renge kyo. Over and over again. Its intention was to align you with your innate Buddhahood, to cleanse you of any bad karma and put you in alignment with your true destiny on earth, to find peace, to find tranquility. Momoko's mum gifted me with my own set of beads and I, be and I began to chant every morning. Eventually I joined a group in Brighton after a serendipitous meeting with an incredibly eccentric, bright colourful suit wearing piano tuner. He spotted my beads and he grinned at me and he pulled out his own. We'd sit in a small group and we'd chant for hours sometimes. There was something comforting about trusting the course of my life and illness to an incomprehensible power outside of myself. I spoke openly in these meetings that I loved feeling part of something, but that I really struggled saying with certainty that I believed in it. This was the issue I faced with every religion I temporarily aligned myself with looking for answers. I, something in me couldn't bring myself to take ancient texts as gospel, all too aware of how man twists so-called spiritual doctrines to suit his own power-hungry pursuits. I wanted divine proof. I sometimes screamed at the sky or the waves and begged for it. I was answered with sickness. If there was a creator, I was angry with it. The irony was that I envied people of faith. I felt like people who truly trusted themselves to a higher power seemed to possess a level of calm and acceptance that I didn't. 
One of my stranger encounters was going to see a shaman. The shaman, of course, was a middle-aged white woman in a quite nice looking cottage in Brighton. She told me to lie down and she proceeded to lean over my body and made noises like coughing up phlegm while speaking an unknown ancient language that seemed to include whistling noises. After about 20 <laughs> minutes of making distressed groaning noises over my back, she paused in contemplation for a while and proceeded to tell me that I'd been killed by a sword in my past life. She made sucking noises near the supposed stab site on my chest and then she spat into a bucket. She then placed a little stone into my hand and she told me that I had to bury it on a high hill in Brighton on the next full moon. The most depressing part of this story is during the next full moon, I did indeed find a big hill, oh, no. dug a small hole and I buried the stone in it. Surprising to say, fuck all happened. <laughs> it was this journey into the spiritual unknown that led me to a very unsettling I experience. Love him so much. I located a therapist online who had claimed to overcome Emmy herself. She specialised in it and dealt with people's past trauma, but also worked with energies like Reiki. I had to get the train to where she lived. She met me in the car and drove me in silence back to hers. There was a bit of an unusual energy about her. I've always been really good at reading people. But I can't quite explain it, but sometimes when I meet someone, it's like I have a sixth sense for whether or not they'll play a significant role in my life. This person's energy felt alien to me. When we arrived at her, she told me that she sometimes would consult with her horses about people's health conditions. It was at this moment I knew that she was probably insane. Nonetheless, I shared a lot about my life. We got into the trauma of living with sickness, what it was like to constantly mourn your own life. It was comforting at first, and it felt like a safe space until it got a bit weird. One day, she offered me a glass of water before a Reiki session, and during the session, I fell into a deep sleep. When I came around, multiple hours had passed, which was peculiar for me. I usually have issues with sleeping and couldn't drift off, particularly not in unfamiliar environments. She assured me it was total normal and to get plenty of, plenty of water, and I thought nothing of it. Lines started getting somewhat blurry when she'd me invite me for meals with her and her husband. I took it as friendliness, but I noticed that she started messaging me outside of clinic hours. One time I agreed to create music for her in exchange for, in exchange for some extra sessions. Not long after, I started getting strange messages in my Facebook inbox. She started telling me how she knew that all my previous songs had been about her, which they hadn't. When I dismissed this, she would sometimes message me saying that she was out beside of my house, telling me that our souls were bonded no. and that bad things would happen oh to me if God. we weren't together. To put it lightly, I was already in a pretty weird emotional place because of years of sickness. So having someone in a position of trust abuse their position like this shook me and it shook my trust in therapy even more. It shook my oh trust no. in people in general. I told her to never wow. contact me again and I blocked her, but she would still occasionally get through on other numbers. One time she'd phoned my mum's house relentlessly. My mum, knowing the details, told her to stop harassing me and threatened to get the police involved after things which went silent. This was also the year that I met my second ever girlfriend, who I'd later be engaged to for a short amount of time. Aww. My little sister had already set the relationship up in her mind. She met this girl in Bristol who she got on with super well and somehow she wingmanned me and planted the seed in her brain that she'd be yeah. perfect for her older brother, me. My sister's friend had moved to Brighton but I was blissfully unaware of this matchmaking. At this point I was living in a house share in Rose Hill Terrace in Brighton with some lunatics I'd met at Ben's house and Momoko had moved down from Cornwall. <laughs> the house was only meant for two people but Momoko and I had pretend we were, pretended we were married and pretended that we were going to have a baby to be able to get it. As soon as the deed was signed, we moved in with about five other friends, one living in the living room, one in the attic, one in the study, one in the conservatory. It's safe to say rent was pretty fucking cheap. <laughs> one night, my friend Luke was throwing a party and she rocked up with a few of her friends. My sister had pretty good taste in girls and I had a crush on her instantly. At some point in the night, we both ended up lying on my bedroom floor on a bunch of sofa cushions while about six other people were sleeping in various places in my room. One somehow in the upper compartment of my wardrobe. True story. <laughs> she asked me to tell her a bedtime story and I, meant, and I made up the most unhinged story I could think of. By some sort of miracle, she found my madness endearing and we ended up kissing a lot and staring into each other's eyes till we fell asleep. It's strange Aww. navigating a relationship when you're sick. I couldn't go out to eat at restaurants because I was allergic to everything. I didn't have the energy to do most normal things that couples do. Some days I'd be so full of brain fog that my personality disappeared and it was hard to explain that to someone without them thinking that maybe you were just being a bit off with them. I think losing Joe, losing Callum, losing the record deal, losing my last girlfriend, it had all made me wary of getting attached to good things. Quite a lot of my illness made me feel ugly and it's hard to accept Aww. love when you feel ugly. Nonetheless, she did love me and with time, our relationship grew.
It was around this time I was contacted by a woman called Jennifer Breer, an incredibly inspiring woman whose journey seemed to parallel mine. She was an incredibly ambitious PhD student at Harvard who one day was struck down by a mystery illness that confined her to a wheelchair. She spent most of her life tirelessly searching for a way out. She was doing a Kickstarter to raise money to make a film called Canary in a Coal Mine. It would later go on to be renamed Unrest and it would go on to win multiple awards and it's still watchable on Netflix to this day. It's an incredibly important and very moving documentary about the horrors of living with Emmy. I recommend everyone checks that out. At the time, yeah, I started health blogging. I created oh. a series of video diaries that I named Me vs. Emmy. It would be a video document of my various trials with different alternative treatment approaches and generally a look into the life of someone with a chronic illness. Look I didn't know it back friend. then, but those videos would save my life. I guess I was occupying a place that was needed as quite quickly many people in the chronic health communities gravitated towards my videos. Every day, I'd be sent messages telling the stories of the people who had fallen in between the cracks in the floorboards. There was heartbreaking stories. Stories of frustration and confusion. People mourning the people that used to be. Some who were new to this world. Some who had been there for decades. I tried to help them in whatever way I could. I tried to comfort people. In my own little way, I became somewhat of a spokesperson for the voiceless. I felt their pain like it was my own. This new pursuit gave me a sense of purpose that I desperately needed. Without purpose, I felt useless. I made a lot of friends and I'd write to them on a daily basis. Some of those friends died. Some of, the, some of those friends that decided to take their lives and they were wicked people. I talked to them a lot. It was this that ultimately made me decide to stop, but that wouldn't be until years later. Immersing myself in the horrors of this illness and trying to carry some of the weight for the others while I still wasn't strong enough to carry my own eventually took its toll. Jen Bria had found my videos and she asked me to make a song for her documentary. I was honored. I wrote a song called Patience. I'll leave you with a video taken at the time to finish off this chapter. I've learned some lessons that will be so valuable for, for like, so it's a blessing and a curse being this ill because it's completely changed me. Like it's, it's, it's turned me from a little cocky teenager into into somebody who's quite um, this, I guess, prepared for things now. Like, like I feel like once I've gone Look through this- Look how tiny, like, like he now, just looks like this okay. little kid. Um, mm. At the same time, as much as I, I, I see it as a blessing, I hate it. <laughs> I do hate it. I think it was Thomas Edison that was like, I haven't um, failed. I've just found a, a thousand things that don't work, which is kind of nice to look at it that way. Like I'm just eliminating things, um, but it really challenges my mind. And yeah, it's just gotten to the point where I'm spending I'd say like 95% of my life in a bedroom, which kind of sucks because my mind is in such a different place in my body, my mind craves life <laughs> so much. It's alright, it's okay, I'm feeling brave, gonna face this day. It's okay, it's alright, no tears will kiss my cheeks tonight, and it's all good, and I'm just fine. My words ring out like hollow shells, just slow down. It takes time, but time moves slow, I know this well And my heart breaks one thousand times a day But for every hope that dies, another one takes its place Because I have the strength of a mountain And I've got the courage of the deep blue sea And I have the heart of a lion And the stars burn bright inside of me And although you test me, my God I stand so proudly, can't you see That I have the strength of a mountain And I'll take all you throw at me This world 
with this, quite scary I know that cause I've been here for some time But all that prepares me for a day when I can truly shine Cause I've been so broken And picking up fragments of myself I'll glue them back together So I can stand at the edge of this world and yell That my heart breaks one thousand times a day for every hope that dies, another one takes its place Because I have the strength of a mountain And I've got the courage of the deep blue sea And I have the heart of a lion And the stars burn bright inside of me And although you test me, my God I stand so proudly, can't you see That I have the strength of a mountain And I'll take all you throw at me Dust the cobwebs off this sheath And I'll take the sword of my belief And in this storm I will not flinch And I will not move No, not an inch Cause I have the strength of a mountain I've got the courage of the deep blue sea And I'll have the heart of a lion And the stars they burn bright inside of me But although you test me, my God I stand so proudly, can't you see? I have the strength of a mountain And I'll take all you throw at me Aww. He's like so adorable. I mean, we see it every time. Yeah. Uh, wow. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. That was Rin Chapman. That, me, that one got it got me a little watery. That song a little, but yeah, I, I did okay. My this I, eyelash I right it. here, like I don't know why I'm only crying out of this eye, not this eye, and this eyelash is soaking wet. <laughs> Make my tear duck. ducks are clogged or something. I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, thanks for watching, guys. Make sure you hit that like, comment, subscribe, tap that bell so that way you get notified anytime the baddies drop. Peace out.